people are waiting for the appearance of a living legend. Ministers of government, ambassadors and their wives, princes of the church, by now they've probably lost count of the number of times they've waited here at Addis Ababa airport for the same extraordinary man. In a moment, he'll step from the door of this aircraft to a scene that's even more familiar to him. And here he comes, the legend in person. One of the world's best known figures and faces, and one that most of us know least about. Father figure of modern Africa and relic of a vanishing world, feudal despot and reforming monarch, one of the last claimants to the divine right of kings, the legendary descendant of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, elect of God, King of Kings, Emperor of Ethiopia. Selassie celebrated his 40th anniversary as emperor, and his own people of Ethiopia came to do him honor. But Haile Selassie in his time has been far more than just the ruler of a small African state. He's become one of the great survivors of our day and of yesterday, riding out in shrewd triumph all that the 20th century could throw at him. Today, Haile Selassie is courted by all the world. At his anniversary reception, the representatives of a hundred nations came to salute the authority of this tiny old man. probably the first African leader to be treated by white men as an equal, and the first to be sacrificed by them in the name of appeasement. He's learned to trust nobody, except perhaps his dog, and yet he's won the respect of the world, for there's no man alive today whose life has spanned so much. Now, in his old age, he's practically the incarnation of the history of our time. began for Haile Selassie in this remote corner of the Horn of Africa in 1892. In London, Queen Victoria had celebrated her golden jubilee. In Africa, the colonial powers were carving up the continent, but the world Haile Selassie was to grow up to had not been dreamed of. He was born in a thatched hut and christened Tafari Makonnen, and though he was of Ethiopia's royal blood, his childhood on these hillsides was as carefree as childhood should be. Ethiopia to the world, then, was not much more than an African fairy tale. In European romance, it was the land of King Solomon's mines, Prester John and the Queen of Sheba, the place called Abyssinia, where the tribe of the Habersham was supposed to live. Only a handful of foreigners had reached its interior and found among its mountains the source of the Blue Nile. The rest was as dark as anything in darkest Africa, hidden by giant mountains from the deadly curiosity of the world. But Europe's romance was Ethiopia's living history. 
There was a rich empire here when most of Europe was in darkness 2,000 years ago. Its ruins still stand at Axum, its first capital. And the title of its first rulers, King of Kings, is that of Haile Selassie today. The empire's history since then is a rich confusion of fact and legend. There are still 50,000 people like these in Ethiopia who call themselves Jews of the House of Israel and claim descent from the first Jews out of Arabia 3,000 years ago. They observe the Jewish Sabbath and mark their pottery with the Star of David. Like Haile Selassie's imperial crest, the star crowns the Lion of Judah, the central Ethiopian symbol, begotten from Sheba, who bore a son to King Solomon and called him Menelik, the first Ethiopian emperor. But the central tradition of Ethiopia is Christianity. Long before most of Europe was converted, the empire was a pillar of Christendom, whose emperor and another title that Haile Selassie carries today, the elect of God. The echoes of 16 centuries of Christianity sound with undiminished faith through Ethiopia's churches now. in Ethiopia was a sort of barbaric Byzantium and a crusading church as well, bestowing the light of Christ upon the heathen tribes. But like other crusaders, it was beset by the growing power of Islam. From over the Red Sea, the Arabs swept into Africa with their own revelation. Soon, Ethiopia was a Christian stronghold surrounded by the Muslim world. from the Muslim invasion, the emperors and priests of Ethiopia kept the Christian faith alive. Here in the 12th century, the emperor Lalibela carved out of the rock the churches of what he hoped would be a new Jerusalem. It was the empire's capital for a hundred years and came to be known as Lalibela after its creator. 800 years later, Haile Selassie was to come here to pray for deliverance from Italy's invasion of his country. At the worst moment of his life, it was his way of declaring his ultimate faith in the God who was so essential to his empire's tradition. A tradition that the monks of Lalibela still voice in a haunting mixture of orthodox plain chant and African rhythm. state became inseparable and the Christian powers of Europe sent emissaries to the emperors to help them against the Muslims. One of them may have been Prester John, some Western Father Jean perhaps, exiled and forgotten here for a lifetime. But in spite of Western help, many of the empire's provinces were overrun. The emperors themselves became nomads wandering the highlands from camp to camp until here at Gondar in the 17th century they came to rest again in renewed splendor. These castles of Gonda are unique in Africa. Probably some Portuguese helped to build them. Possibly Indian craftsmen were brought in. 
but they're a sign of Ethiopia's special distinction in Africa as a place where the non-African world made some early mark on the continent. only a brief revival of a declining empire. In another hundred years, the court was on the march again, still carrying the Christian banner, but challenged at every step by powerful feudal barons, as the kings of medieval England used to be. Only the church held Ethiopia together, and gradually authority shifted again toward the church strongholds in the central mountains. Here, the empire that Haile Selassie would inherit began to take shape under King Sahri Selassie, his great-grandfather. King Sahli was one of the most powerful barons, and it was to him that the new commercial empires of 19th century Europe came with their gifts and guns. And his kingdom was the foundation on which the Ethiopian empire was rebuilt. Its revival was heralded by a Christian crusade, led by a man who was half monk, half warrior, and who defeated all other contenders for the throne, the Emperor Theodore. But in 1862, Theodore fell foul of Queen Victoria. By a misunderstanding, she failed to answer one of his letters, and in a huff, Theodore imprisoned a British consul and some European missionaries in his mountain fortress at Magdala. When five years of diplomacy failed to secure their release, the British at last sent a military expedition to recover them. It was a ponderous exercise, but effective. With elephants, gun carriages, and Indian sepoys under the command of General Napier, they clambered steadily into the mountains that had been Ethiopia's best defense for so long. The Ethiopians were no match for them. They had few rifles and no artillery to save their old empire from the new world. As Napier's army approached their last stronghold, Theodore shot himself. The new concept of empire had triumphed over the old. Yet in Theodore's medieval crusade, there was a glimpse of a new Ethiopia. And 20 years later, under the Emperor Menelik, grandson of Sahli Selassie and half-uncle to Haile Selassie, that glimpse became something like reality. Europe's scramble for Africa was then in full swing, and as the Western empires planted their flags all over the continent, only Menelik's Ethiopia seemed able to stand against them. At Addis Ababa in Sahli Selassie's old kingdom, Menelik created a new capital for his empire. It was Ethiopia's first permanent capital since the heyday of Gonda, 200 years before. Menelik's palace is still used 80 years later by Haile Selassie, and to him it's a permanent reminder of the day when Ethiopia showed that it could, after all, resist the power of Europe when Menelik's army in these mountains defeated an Italian invasion at the Battle of Adawa. The year was 1896, and the traditional Ethiopian painting tells the story of a modern awakening. first time a European army had been defeated by Africans since Hannibal beat the Romans 2,000 years ago. Menelik's celebrations were huge and noisy. For days on end, the drink ran like water and the tables were red with the blood of raw meat. In the rejoicing, the Ethiopians hardly noticed that they had still to pay a price for their independence. From now on, they would be enmeshed in the quarrels of the European powers. While the new ambassadors and their lady wives looked with astonishment at Menelik's medieval feasts, they were secretly seeking for allies here in the power struggle that was raging in Europe. Into this strange twilight world between yesterday and today, 
Haile Selassie was born. Now, after 80 years, he looks back on a lifetime that has spanned the gap between the 2,000 years of African tradition he inherited and our own jet-propelled international revolution that threatens to overwhelm him. One of his earliest memories is of the way our world first encroached on his, with the arrival in Ethiopia of the first British diplomatic mission to the court of his half-uncle Menelik. He was five years old. The year was 1897, just a year after the great victory of Adawa and the British mission on its way to Addis Ababa stayed with the young Haile Selassie's father in the town of Harar. Harar then was a newly conquered province of Menelik's empire, taken from Muslim hands. Haile Selassie's father, Ras Makonnen, was Menelik's governor for Harar and a favorite to succeed to the throne. In Muslim hands, Harar had been a secret city, closed to non-Muslims for centuries. Forty years earlier, the British explorer Richard Burton had only been able to get here disguised as an Arab. He didn't think much of what he saw. The streets were stony and narrow, the faces were stern and secretive. He thought they justified the local proverb, hard as the heart of Harar. <laughs> not a great deal better now, but for what change there is, Haile Selassie's father can take some credit. He allowed French priests to open this little mission school in the town, and sent his son, Tafari Makonnen, to learn from them. Seventy years later, French is still the only foreign language Haile Selassie speaks with any fluency. Today, the school is little changed, but in coming here as a boy, Haile Selassie recalls that he had an advantage given to very few others in the empire at that time, and he's been obsessed with the value of education ever since. His father is remembered by Haile Selassie as an unusually enlightened man. He built Harar's first hospital. He opened the first Ethiopian state school. And because he knew he might one day become emperor himself, and that Tafari would succeed him. He tried to prepare his son as best he could for the changes that he knew were bound to come from the traditional ways of the old world to the revolutionary demands of the new. So throughout his boyhood, the young Tafari lived happily in his father's house with a future that seemed secure. But suddenly, his father died and Tafari passed at once from security into a world of medieval intrigue. He was only 13. Menelik was dying, paralyzed by a stroke. He had no son of his own, and with Ras McConnell's death, the last chance of a clear succession had gone. His court was wracked with the jealous plots of rivals for his throne. There was Taitu, his aging queen. Zauditu, his daughter, equally determined to get the throne herself. Ras Michael, a powerful provincial warlord, scheming to put his dissolute son and Menelik's nephew, Li Jiasu, on the throne. Against such plotters, the young Tafari had no chance. He was exiled as governor of another conquered province. Meanwhile, Menelik's palace seethed with treachery and murder, like the household of some African King Lear. For five years, the conspiracies tore the court apart, until in 1911, the doddering Menelik at last revealed his choice. Ras Michael's son, Li Jiasu, was the heir to his throne. The queen and his daughter were thrust aside, and Tafari Makonnen joined Ethiopia's other barons in swearing an oath of loyalty to his rival. As a reward, he was sent to his father's old job as governor of Harar. In Harar, Tafari was safely out of the way, a week's journey from the capital. He was just 19, but he was experienced far beyond his years. Already he knew not only how to run a province, but how to play a waiting game, and he knew there was still a crown to play for. He needed all his caution, because when Menelik died at last, and Li Jiasu was crowned, 
the new emperor was already half mad with syphilis, turning from youthful dissipation to exotic vice and murder. He tried to murder Tafari on this lake near Harar, where Tafari often went boating with friends. This time, Li Jiasu bribed a servant to hold the boat so that it sank in the middle of the lake. A friend was drowned. Tafari survived by swimming ashore. The foreign embassies dabbled in these plots as well. The new diplomats who'd surrounded Menelik now imposed on these medieval intrigues the shape of approaching war in Europe. Germany and Turkey stood with Li Jiasu. Britain, France and Italy swung to Tafari's side. It was 1914, and as the guns opened up on Europe's western front, 4,000 miles away, the contest in Ethiopia took an older shape. Christianity once again prepared for a clash with Islam. A Muslim empire in Africa was the bait dangled before Li Jiasu by Germany and Turkey. And in his craze for power, the new ruler of a Christian empire became a Muslim in all but name. For the Christians, it was the last straw. Vice, murder and rape they were accustomed to, but apostasy struck at the heart of their tradition. Li Jiasu was formally excommunicated from the Ethiopian church, and with British encouragement, Tafari was proclaimed regent with the title of Ras, or Prince. He was 24 years old. Zauditu, Menelik's daughter, was crowned empress at the same time. But the struggle was unfinished. Li Jiasu was still free, and on this great plain north of Addis Ababa, his father, Ras Michael, gathered an army to restore him to the throne. It was another medieval scene. The horsemen were dressed in the monkey skins of war with Ras Michael at their head. On the other side, Rastafari's men gathered for battle in the same way. In Europe, the bloodiest of modern wars was being fought with tanks, machine guns and poison gas. But here, ahead. On the other side, Rastafari's men gathered for battle in the same way. In Europe, the bloodiest of modern wars was being fought with tanks, machine guns and poison gas. But here, the centuries rolled back as if to King Henry at Agincourt, or Richard losing his crown at Bosworth Field. Menelik's victory at Adawa. This battle of Rastafari for his crown has become one of the great subjects of Ethiopia's popular art. <laughs> the battle lasted a full day, surging one way and then another. But in the end, the man who rode back to Addis Ababa in triumph was Rastafari. It was a victory that he still recalls as the turning point of his life. But almost immediately, he was embroiled in the outcome of the other war in Europe. At the Versailles Peace Conference in their victory, the Allies again redrew the map of Africa. But once more, Ethiopia escaped. Playing off the great powers against each other, Rastafari kept his independence. Joining the new League of Nations, he put his faith in the latest post-war watchword, collective security. In such great company, one little country would surely be safe, and none would let another gobble it up. Instead, he hoped that all might compete in helping him to modernize his country and make it worthy of its place in the League. To extend his foreign contacts, he toured the European capitals. In London, the Times described his arrival as an historical event. In Stockholm, he met King Gustav, and the Swedes promised him doctors. In Brussels, he found financiers ready to invest in his country. The French were already in Ethiopia. They had completed a railway from the coast to Addis Ababa in 1918. It was Ethiopia's first physical link with the modern world, and it helped to establish Addis as a permanent center of Ethiopian government, as no capital had ever been before. Tafari still needed all the foreign help he could get. Most of Ethiopia was still sunk in the Middle Ages, 
and Addis Ababa was still only a ramshackle place of tin roofs and open drains. He had to fight poverty and tradition, but he was still only regent, and his hands were still tied by his old enemies at court, who were once more plotting against him. It wasn't until 1930 that Rastafari won supreme power at last and ascended the throne when the Empress Zauditu died. Crowned emperor at last at the age of 38, Jafari took the royal name of Haile Selassie, meaning the mighty trinity. His coronation was attended by men of rank and circumstance from all over the world. The Duke of Gloucester went from Britain. France sent a field marshal. Italy, the heir to the throne. Governors of Africa's colonial territories came to salute the independent African king. His own people poured into Addis Ababa in thousands to pay homage to the new emperor. At this moment, Ethiopia seemed about to be the first country in black Africa to step hopefully into the modern world. Instead, the modern world marched almost at once into Ethiopia far more brutally than before. Benito Mussolini, the Italian dictator, proclaimed he would create a new Roman Empire, and he aimed at the one place left for imperial conquest in Africa, Haile Selassie's Ethiopia. Mussolini's excuse was Ethiopia's best.